Good to see you as always, sir. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work. And please pass the word to all the undersecretaries and everybody that comes in front of the Disability Assistance Subcommittee. Thank I'm you. not always easy on it, but they're doing, they're doing an amazing job. That. They're not doing I a heard job. you um, state that the previous year's numbers and the growth rate employees and, and the successes that we have are having in the VA, which I'm, I'm you're not having, having over the moon about. But there is one number that grew last year that you and I spoke about that shouldn't be growing. And that's your number one issue from what I understand of the VA issue, and that's suicide. Yes. That is something we have yet to corral. And as a neuroscientist studying the brain and emotional behaviors for the past 15 years now, I think, I... I and you failed to ask how I, I want to solve this problem. We sh this shouldn't be a conversation that we're having. And you and I, every time we have a meeting together, this is the number one topic that we talked about. And I heard the general speak about... Um, the progression of alternative medications in space of or alt, an alternative to the opioid problems that we have, the SSRIs and, yes. and the existing modalities that we are utilizing for these problem sets. But you're not getting that the correct science. You know, if you roll the clock back a decade, the numbers are they're sustained. Right. We are not doing no, what we need to be doing. Right. And we need to fix that problem, and, and, and it, is, it, it, it saddens and sickens me to sit here in the House of Representatives, representatives to say that, hey, we have this problem, we have to fix it, but we say this every year. You call it. And I want the VA to be the leading edge of the sword. You have that capability. If there's legislation that's not in place that allows the VA to be where the, all, the, all the other institutes of higher learning and research come running to the VA to say, you are leading the way, how can we help you or can we learn from you? That's what I want to see. Because that transcends the research space down into our veteran community where we don't have this problem set. What with the, with the budget line, I mean, I throw numbers at this all day long. What are we going to do? How are we going to fix this problem? And I know you can't answer that question because it, it exists. I, such can, a I can answer that. Wide net that we have to. <clears throat> here's, here's the answer for you. The answer is uh, you repeal um, PL 114-198. That's the answer. Okay, that's the answer to 99% of these problems. That's the answer to um, Jen Kagan's uh, and 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 uh, and uh, Mike Bell's uh, uh, letter to today out um, complaining about you know the the problems out at uh, one of these facilities that is, is relatively minor to what's going on all over the place, and you guys are completely unaware of it. And the secretary of the VA um, seems to find you guys amusing, chasing your tails instead of asking real questions and getting to them to the real uh, cause and problems. And that is that you have no idea what you guys are talking about when it comes to medications. No idea the results. You have no idea the outcomes because the congress the congress passed that comprehensive addiction and recovery act that requires them to lie to you yeah. and it opened that door that they then expanded so far beyond opioids that it's now impacting every care decision so here's a little experiment for you if uh you guys want to find out ask the secretary if a veteran who is, has been flagged for violent or disruptive behavior is part of any of those studies that the secretary keeps touting that shows care and outcomes are so much better than the VA. Because I'm willing to bet the 23,000 plus veterans that are red flagged every year who don't get surveys, who don't get their outcomes reported, because the law says they can't, would have a whole lot more impact on the outlook of the VA and what was going on if you had access to that information, which you don't, which you told VA that you did not want and to hide from you with the CARE Act. That's what's going on. That's why the numbers keep on increasing because you gave them this opportunity to censor protected patient complaints initially maybe it was a good idea but once you allowed that censorship to happen the va kicked the door open 
and has now been doing it for decade, for entire decade. As these numbers are going up, it's because we've lost our voice, we've lost our protected prediction reporting, we, we, we have police that are coming after us, can't even report. We, we, the veterans can't even make a police report to the VA police if they've been red flagged, if they have a VA employee after them. They'll be not allowed. This is such an extensive problem. And it just seems like until you guys will take a step back, look at what's really going on, and adjust, this will continue to get worse. You guys are on the complete wrong trail. The VA just laughs at Congress because you gave them exactly what they asked for by giving them that exemption and that ability to censor patient complaints. These VSOs were all about it. Uh, matter of fact, that during this exact hearing here, later on, one of the VSOs goes on about opioids. Okay, the, the opioid production is, isn't anywhere even near that they, they could actually, if every one of those went out to the street, cause as much damage as is happening. Okay, it's an impossibility. There's not enough production. Okay, it's you've literally blinded yourself to the problems. And with what you did with the censorship, with the CARE Act, may have been well-intentioned, but it is now killing us. It is, it is, it's exactly what's behind the stuff that's going on out there for the anesthesiologist, for all these other problems that's going on. They're all being concealed by this program. So, So, oh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time you. um, and, and waiting around with this situation that we had today. But no I do problem. need to, to, to address one more important matter before you leave. Please. Um, over the past year, VA has been more than a month late in responding to over a dozen letters. Currently, VA owes this committee responses to numerous letters, including on important issues like improper benefit payments, abortion, year. and employee misconduct at VA medical centers. Further, record, when VA finally responds to committee letters, the response day, is often uh, inadequate. No, uh, your, uh, repeat, uh, your repeated failure to provide sufficient answers to my ORMDI letter last fall led to the committee's first subpoena in eight years. Most recently, in your two month, you're two months late on response to a letter seeking documents related to VA's attorney anti-Semitic anti uh, comments. Uh, and we haven't been given any of the documents that we were asking for. So I do want to ask if we can get your commitment for the those documents that I asked for and the letter that was in January 20th, that we'd sent on January 25th, uh, if we could try to get those by next Friday, if at all possible. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, turn to this as soon as I get back to the office. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for, as I said, waiting around when... We don't, you know, we don't normally do this. So. No, no. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure, Would you like to welcome the next panel up. Well, Representative Boast and Kiggins and Latrell and Van Orden and all and, and General Bergman and um, especially General Bergman. I, I have to imagine you're very well aware why this is happening. Um, you've been around long enough. You were there when CARE Act was passed, weren't you? Um, you have to know that that's, that's what's killing us, that that's what is silencing veterans. Um, that's what's allowing this to continue. Um, this is, uh, it needs to end. Um, we need veterans patient protective reporting returned. This will end to a large degree, along with all the other abuses. Um, and so when you have Secretary uh, McDonough, uh, sorry, McDonough, um, stating that survey after survey, study after study, um, it's a lie. It is a lie. The 23,000 veterans that are red flagged every year are not being surveyed. 
Their outcomes are not being tracked. It's a parlor trick. Okay. Now, to not track and record those outcomes would be okay for a certain segment of the population if the law and rulemaking didn't expand it so ridiculously that it's being used against all veterans, essentially, with any complaints. Um, you know, uh, if they complain more than one or more than twice about it, um, they'll find themselves red flagged. They'll find themselves on the disruptive behavior uh, committee, um, being reviewed, red flagged, permanent records, permanent histories of violence, permanent histories of, of disruptive behavior, um, things that, that can be sought out um, for support for warrants and such like. Uh, so this is what the CARE Act did, okay? It was supposed to be this narrow thing, but now it has a general applica- uh, applicability. Sorry. Um, <laughs> knocked myself unconscious today. I'm still <laughs> freaking fucked up. Um, but so the general applica- applicability of this is to all patients now. Um, and it's recorded. I, I've seen the files that are used in this program against general complaints, nothing to do with opioids, nothing to do with medications even, which was the first expansion. It went from opioids to medications to any treatment now that Secretary HHS uh, puts on that uh, program. So literally, you can have somebody right now from CDC coming in front of you, and they know the data is false, and they can lie to you because you gave them permission to in the name of the opioid crisis. That's what she did. This is what's killing all patient reporting. This is what's killing patient safety. All right. People who are caught up in this, all right, or can be tagged with this, are being tagged with it and being silenced. This is the numbers. Okay. This is the history here. All right. Here's where the breakout is, seven-year implementation, all right, leading to a 53,000% increase of uh, VHA employees reporting veterans as violent and destructive threats to them in a seven-year period. All right, but see, we even knew, we knew though, and, and, the, v, and the VAOG knew through all the reporting that the, the program was already um violating at least a quarter of the veterans civil rights um by not denying them their their uh, awarded benefits um you know and then you have places like augusta and like a four-year augusta georgia in a four-year span increased red flag use against patients in a four-year in a, uh, by 400 percent um or the trend that there's far more red flag veterans in swing states Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. All right. And, and, and there's not, if you look at the federal law enforcement numbers through VHA, you look at the OIG reports, everything else, nobody's violence numbers come close to what these medical VHA medical providers are lying about and reporting. It are lies. They've been caught now. Um, The ladies who ran the program decided to change it, you know, unilaterally and didn't do it properly, um, leading to this wonderful um, destruction of 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 the most patriotic and civil rights loving um, segment of the population Um, and just just cause so much harm uh so this is what they did they put out a report recently telling on themselves on how they modified the program all right to um use the disruptive behavior program uh and violence report workplace violence reporting program to uh support uh dei efforts um 10 years ago they started doing this um so, and you can see on the chart here, I mean, there's, there's, they're not even, they're not even stating there's a whole bunch of violence in comparison. Um, you know, again, this is a program that's essentially the real violence has remained flat for more than 20, the rate 
has remained flat FHA for more than 26 years. But yet, all of a sudden, of a seven-year period, they've gained a 53,000% increase. That's us being silenced. And once that happens, you can talk to the people who, who know periods in which they were red flagged. They didn't ever receive uh, service uh, surveys or quality assurance uh, surveys. Sorry. Um, so here's here's this. This is worth reading. Um, the people in here, uh, let's see here. Lynn Van Mal, she was a director for either workplace violence or the disruptive behavior side. And then Callie Vance, that's the, the other side. So one's uh, workplace violence, one's uh, disruptive behavior, I think. Um, and then this, I think this dude's in there now too. Um, he's one of the directors or some crap. Interesting thing is, uh, he's out of Dayton, I think, or Cincinnati. Either way, both of them are, are out of control si uh, situations. Um, in which one of them, one of those systems reportedly deleted their entire uh, disruptive behavior committee minutes, uh, the entire record. Um, something that's supposed to be maintained for archives, but you know, apparently you can just get away with that stuff. Um, I had Ann Arbor delete an entire, or apparently lost an entire month of their uh, committee minutes uh, as well. So interesting how, you know, nobody gets in trouble for, you know, losing civil rights uh, um, recording um, minutes uh, where they're making decisions, clinical decisions against us. So, um, and you can see, you know, as I've been going through, going through this, I reported this to here's Secretary McDonough's. I reported over IG, OIG for years, um, you know, as, as I was uh, being contacted by all these veterans about these flags. Um, I'm trying to find. Uh, oh, so here it is. <laughs> so um, this just dropped. And what this is, is a uh, recent update to uh, the handbook on um, how these um, databases are supposed to be set up. And if you look at this, now if you go reading at the, uh, the democratized uh, disruptive behavior reporting in healthcare systems, uh, BHA just published, um, you'll see they told on themselves and they've essentially violated every single thing in here um, with their program. So I, 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 what do we do here? I mean, this is, this is, uh, I can't, I can't really seem to get, um, I mean, this is all good. You know, this seems, you know, a lot of the reporting that I seem to be doing is finally, um, reaching where it needs to be, but there's people who have been pushed out. There's veterans that have been pushed out that are still out who have been driven away or wrongly and properly barred that need to be brought back in the system. And we need to stop saying that, you know, that uh, <coughs> these VA employees are somehow being, um, or, or trying to, to really connect that these VA employees are being hurt and injured by male um, patients um, at some record level. And it's just not happening. It's a fucking lie. And it needs to end because it's creating more issues for access. 90% um, of the population at the VA are males. But like something between 70 and 75% of each of the facilities are, are female. Okay. And what it creates is this, this they, we're, we're not communicating on the same plane. Something that is VA has, has, has constantly indicated um, for, for decades when it comes to male providers for female vets. Now we have this massive, um, you know, system that's been turned upside down where, um, combat veterans specifically can't go in and get care because if they accidentally upset one of their providers, they can lose their freedom. Because there is no checks and balances. There is no due process. This is a secret clinical panel making secret clinical decisions that they may or may not have to even notify you of. So, I mean, this is, the, and, and again, this is where all the quality assurance, this is um, one of the cases like uh, 
out there in Montana, what, you know, Secretary, uh, or I'm sorry, um, Senator Testers, uh, Montana, you know, there was a geriatric vet that was uh, abused by um, two uh, employees, and um, he had uh, reported it and everything else. They ran and made disruptive behavior complaints against him because he was trying to protect himself with his walker or um, some such um, to keep from being physically abused and injured anymore. Um, by these two well essentially their their complaints you know nullified his report um which is which is exact you know patients protected report is not supposed to be he's not supposed to have any kind of reprisals to it you're not even supposed to have any concerns of reprisals and here it's active reprisal against physical violence um or physical injury against a patient and they can just run and say oh well through his 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 protecting himself can claim that he is the one being violent. Uh, it's just this amazing thing, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, I, I mean, myself, my own case of, of trying to get um, out from under this has been five years just to get a civil rights case before a federal judge um, to get a record accusing me of crimes and uh being non-compliant with my health care and, and all these other things that literally it was criminalized my health care, um, my access and everything. It's, it's just this. And, uh, and throughout this entire time has been accompanied, you know, I've made the reports to Congress. I made the reports to the OIG, um, to uh, DOJ. I mean, it, I, nobody would even take a uh, police report from me uh, in regards to this doctor running around making false police, false FBI, false uh, VHA, disruptive behavior reports left, right, and center against me. Um, and luckily, all the law enforcement continually found her reports unfounded, but the disruptive behavior committee continually found me guilty. So, I mean... <laughs> And I can, I have the records. I can show that to the committee. Yeah. But for some reason, I uh, been having a very difficult time for access, and um, I'm just wondering now if it's not uh, the VHA. And, and you can see here is, you know, um, here here's just one of the things: so it's the service recovery. They realize, and this is about the record that's before the judge right now. Um, this is uh, April um, 2020. Um, and you can see they knew then that the shit was wrong and, and everything. And um, <laughs> the uh, and then this lie down here is, is uh, directly contradicted by the people she, she ends up quoting um, in both my medical record and on recorded uh, uh, appointments. But um, so then there's this uh, publication that is called uh, called uh, Directive One 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 Two, which is the um, correspondence requiring no reply policy. As a policy that every congressman must read today. Thanks. Bye.